this group inside of Israel, all of those that believe in Him, all of those that hearken to Him. What do you call someone that hearkens or listens to Jesus? You call him His disciple. Those are the ones that listen. And it will come to pass that every soul that will not hearken, every soul that will not hearken, all of these that are not the disciples of Christ, they will be cut off from among the people. And first of all, there is a pruning phase. And this is the pruning phase. A reforming phase. A pruning phase. And Jesus comes and makes disciples and baptizes them. Makes disciples and baptizes them. You have baptized disciples of Jesus. And this is where you start to find the ethical tension. Because nobody has a right to be a baptized disciple of Jesus unless he's converted through the gospel. But there were sometimes people that made professions of faith and were baptized who weren't truly converted. That's a reality. It's a sad reality. This is not an absolutely perfect on earth method. But the purpose of this was to find those that were right with God, that truly knew the Lord, that hearkened to Messiah. And it was to remove by right anyone else out of Israel. It's not perfect in fact. Because sometimes hypocrites say they're disciples when they're not. Sometimes apostates say they're disciples when they're not. And they get baptized when they shouldn't be. On earth that's not a perfect method. The gospel method of calling out the righteous is not a perfect method on earth. But through that gospel method Jesus formed a community. And that was a community of those that hearkened unto him. Now listen, this community is Hebrew, Christian, Israel. Why is that? Because these is, this is still Israel. And out of this Israel, these are, these are Christian Israel. These people are all still Jews. They haven't changed. And those are the only people that are left in Israel. Everybody else has been cut out of this society this is all that's left of the people of God. This is a remnant according to the election of grace. It's the remnant now. And this is the remnant. This is Israel. This is not anymore. They got cut out. Every soul that will not hearken, that won't listen to him, hear him, receive him, receive him as master, become his disciple, and openly confess that in baptism is going to be cut out of the people of God. And that's why when it says, this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel, you have to understand, this is the house of Israel. That's who this is. This is not. It got cut out. And this is the method, the gospel method. Making and baptizing disciples, by which they were pruned. Then after the pruning phase, comes an instituting phase. What does Jesus do? The night before he dies, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. He institutes the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper is the token of the new covenant. This cup equals. Cup equals covenant. Remember that? Remember that? Cup equals covenant. That means it's the token of the covenant. This cup, the Lord's Supper. Eat the bread, drink the cup. Melchizedek in the Old Testament. You know what he came forth with? The fruit of the vine and bread. Fruit of the vine and bread. Melchizedek brought forth bread and wine. And so Jesus institutes that Melchizedekian bread and fruit of the vine to be the token of the new covenant. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This is the token. This represents the new covenant in my blood. And so he institutes it right there. He accomplishes redemption for them. And he gives them the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost as the down payment of their inheritance. He sheds His blood for them. He institutes the token of the new covenant and He gives them the Holy Spirit as a down payment of their inheritance. And then this Israel grows and 3,000 get added to it and saved and they get baptized. They join the church. And then it grows throughout Acts chapter 8 and then it grows all the way up to Acts 9.31 and includes Jews and Samaritans. And at this point, they're at least... From, from that land and their Hebrews and circumcised and Jews and from, Jude, from Judea and Samaria and they're all disciples 
and Christians and Hebrews and Samaritans. And they've received the Holy Spirit. Now, in Acts chapter 9, you read about that. Then in Acts chapter 10, something absolutely remarkable happens. Into this Hebrew Christian Israel, into Christian Israel under the New Covenant. This is what happened. New Covenant's instituted now. God grafts people. The gospel comes to Cornelius, and Cornelius and his family, uncircumcised Gentiles, get grafted in. There's an engrafting phase. And these people get grafted in. And when they get grafted in, the result of that engrafting is a tremendous controversy because people say, wait a minute, these people are uncircumcised and they're Gentiles. And we've got to circumcise them and tell them they've got to do all the ordinances in the book. We've got to make them proselytes to the Hebrew religion. And the apostles said, no way. Because the distinguishing trait of Christian Israel is not that it's circumcised in body in Abraham's physical seed, but the distinguishing trait of Christian Israel is that it's circumcised in soul and Abraham's spiritual children. And that's why these Gentiles are included, because they also are children of Abraham. And these, and that's why we read in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 22, that once you were, at that time, strangers from Christ and alienated from the covenants of the promise, and you were not, Gentiles were not part of the commonwealth of Israel, but now you've been grafted in. Now you're included in the commonwealth of Israel. And so Christian Israel, under the new covenant, is not exclusively Hebrew anymore. But Christian Israel, under the new covenant in its formation, now includes Jews and Gentiles. Whether you're circumcised in body is a thing indifferent. It includes Gentiles and Jews who believe in Christ, who are Abraham's spiritual children, and who are circumcised in heart. And in this way, it continues by a spiritual generation, from generation to generation until the final generation. It continues to grow, not by physical procreation, but by the but by gospel propagation. And it has children, spiritual children, not physical children, through the gospel. And when children are born to Christian Israel through the gospel, then they are to be added in to the society of God's people. So it's through, from generation to generation that the church continues on earth until the final generation when Jesus presents it to himself. And of course, this Hebrew Israel... Uh, this, sorry, Christian Israel is nothing other than the Christian church. And in the very same apostolic generation, the judgment came upon what was left of the shell to the uttermost. And the, the temple the, and, the, and the forms of fellowship of the old covenant were destroyed. And the Aaronic priesthood and all of its genealogical records were destroyed. It was all destroyed. Now, it's impossible that they should ever be the people of God again. They are not the people of God anymore. The theocracy is taken away from them and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Matthew 21, 43. And at one time, and they're not two peoples of God, but one people of God. But what about if these people that have been cut off, what if they believe in Christ? Can they be grafted into Israel again? And the answer is yes. Paul says absolutely yes because they were broken off by their unbelief. And if they turn to the Lord, then they are once again grafted back into Israel under the new covenant. So Israel new covenant grows through the gospel. Okay. Who are the partakers? It is Christian Israel, Jesus and his disciples. The successive generations through uh, growing through the gospel from generation to generation. It's the church on earth and the spirits of just men made perfect in heaven. The final generation at the second coming of Christ. What is its substance? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ unconditionally promised to the people. Ratification through the blood of Christ after those days through the blood of Jesus shed. Mediation through Jesus, the token, the cup. The Lord's Supper is the token of the new covenant. Explicitly. With reference to its fellowship, we have a superior fellowship to what they had because we have a high priest and we have a we are all priests and we offer up spiritual sacrifices, not blood sacrifices. We have a tabernacle and Jesus has entered into heaven itself 
and we are the temple of God on earth. So we have a superior priesthood, a royal priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices of praise and giving. We have a spiritual temple on earth, which is the presence of the Holy Spirit with us and the tabernacle in heaven itself. A new priesthood, a new tabernacle, and a new day of rest and worship, which is the Lord's Day. A new set feast, if I can put it that way. The fulfillment of the new covenant is that it will absolutely be fulfilled and the church will remain on earth faithful in every generation, though a specific local church may depart from the faith. Or an individual professing Christian may turn away. That will be a hypocrite. But true Christians will all be preserved to glory. And the true church of Christ on earth will always remain in every generation until Jesus comes. That's the fulfillment. And finally, the functions. This has tremendous functions in redemptive history. It's the very image of the heaven realities. It's the final covenant with the people of God. It's the clearest display of the gospel. And in it, Christ is revealed explicitly and fully to his people. Now, all of these things are summarized in the handout that I gave you, where it says um, about the uh, about about the uh, benefits of the new covenant. Although the old covenant was truly gracious, the new covenant is far superior to it, because it embodies the very image of the heavenly realities, the very substance of scheme of salvation from sin and spiritual blessings in Christ, not merely shadows of them, because its promises endure permanently and forever. Okay. Now, what does all this have to do with the land? Okay? What does all this have to do with the land? Well, a couple of things about this. Remember we asked about, you asked about the land. First of all, in the providence of God, I was reading in my devotions this morning, and I was reading in the book of Deuteronomy, and I happened to read Deuteronomy 12 to 26. And I came up with 20 passages in there, and you can read through it and see. But the first one is just Deuteronomy 12.1. He gives them the book of the law to do in the land. And there are many places where it says in Deuteronomy 12 through 26 that you cannot possibly do the things that are written in the book of the law unless you live in the land. Secondly, it says in Genesis chapter 7, teen, verse 7 and 8, that the land is given to them for an everlasting possession. Now I have here 12 different sheets which have about 200 places where everlasting were translated forever. The word is olam is used. It is true that sometimes it means absolutely and completely, without ending, without beginning, eternally, from the beginning to the end of time. For example, the everlasting God in Genesis 21:33. There are other times, however, where it refers to the temporary institutions of the Old Covenant, which pass away after a long time at the end of the age, at the coming of Messiah. It refers to the uh, Aaronic priesthood a, a number of times. Exodus 30, 21, Leviticus 6, 22, and so, so many, many, many times. It refers to the Day of Atonement in Ezekiel 16. It refers to the Saturday Sabbath in Ezekiel 31, 16. It refers to the set feast in Leviticus 23, 21. Um, the Aaronic priesthood is said to be, a per, and the showbread is said to be a perpetual statute, Leviticus 24 9. And on and on and on we could go. The, day, the Aaronic priesthood, the showbread, the Saturday Sabbath, all of these things. And what the word sometimes means is that, these, that, that it is something which continues until the vanishing point, until the end of the age. And the vanishing point of the old covenant with its distinctive inheritance and its distinctive uh, fellowship with God the and its distinctive of Hebrew Israel as the people of God, the vanishing point of that is the first coming of Christ. Now, the people of God have already received their new inheritance. The land of Canaan is not our inheritance totally as it was theirs. So you have a number of reasons for saying that the 
land of Canaan is not the inheritance of the people of God characteristically in the time and era and under the new covenant. Number one, the intimate connection between the land of Canaan and the book of the law. You cannot do you, it, you cannot do the things in the book of the law unless you live in the land of Canaan. You cannot. It's not possible. It's the book of the it's the it's the land of the law and the law of the land. The two things stand or fall together. The book of the law goes, so the land of Canaan cannot be the characteristic inheritance of the people of God anymore. Second argument is that the new inheritance has already been given to the people of God. And here's the irony of it. The new inheritance involves its down payment, the Holy Spirit, then its next installment, heaven and glory. But the final installment of our inheritance is a new heavens and new earth which will be related somehow to this heavens and earth after it passes through the fire. And that new heavens and new earth will include everything in the new heavens and new earth, including the land of France, if there is one, and the land of Germany, if there is one, and the land of Palestine, if there is one, and the lands of Africa and America and every other place on earth. So ultimately, will we inherit every piece of real estate on earth? Yes, we will. And does that include the land of Canaan? Yes, it most surely does and every other place on earth. Now, the physical Jews, the third argument is that the physical Jews, Hebrew Israel, are no longer the people of God. There are not two peoples of God. There's only one. And as I've shown you, the people of God has gone through this transition. And those physical Israelites that don't believe in Christ are not God's people anymore. They are no longer God's people. And that old covenant with them has been broken. They broke it. And the ultimate act of rebellion against God was when they murdered God incarnate and crucified God. Their own God came and killed them. And it was in that act of ultimate rebellion the old covenant was broken and they were cut off of the people when they murdered God incarnate at the hands of Gentiles. Now, are they able to be grafted in again to this new people? Under the new covenant? Yes. In the soul, will they receive the inheritance? Yes. Will the inheritance be the Holy Spirit? Yes. And will it be heaven? Yes. And will it be um, the entire earth? Yes. It will be. So God is able to graft them in again. But as a, as a group, as a community, they cease being the people of God in the apostolic generation. And they're not God's people as a community anymore. Now, what right did they have then to the land of Palestine? Well, I mean, I don't have an absolute answer to that question. My, my answer to that question is what right did the Frenchmen have to the land of France? What right did the Englishmen have to the British Isles? What right do Americans have to the land territory of the United States? And we are not distinctively the people of God. The French are not distinctively the people of God. The English are not distinctively the people of God. The Syrians are not distinctively the people of God. The Israelis are not distinctively the people of God. We get into land disputes and boundary disputes. If there was a boundary dispute between the Russians and the Americans over Alaska, they've got to settle it. And if there's a boundary dispute between the Israelis and the Palestinians over real estate, they have to settle it in the way that other nations must settle their boundary disputes. As far as being distinctively the people of God in their unbelief, they are not. No. Now that's my that's my answer to the question about the land. Now, I just want to say one final thing in closing with regard to our very last lecture, and that's the concluding lecture. And that has to do with the tremendous importance of God's covenants. I trust my friends, that you have seen from all these things that God's covenants are very important. Especially the covenant with Christ, God incarnate, and the covenant with his people, Christian Israel. Hebrews chapter 6 indicates that God has interposed with an oath in order that we might have a strong encouragement. It is through the reality of God's covenant love and faithfulness and his loyalty to us as his people that we have great cause to thank him and bless his name. We have great reason for confidence and strong encouragement that God has a good will for us which will never be shaken or turned away from us. 
We know and can predict what God intends to do and what goodness and graciousness he designs toward us. We have a pattern here that we in, keep, would keep our word as God keeps his and that we too would be faithful to our commitments. And we have a great basis for prayer and that basis for prayer is that God would give to us what he has pledged and that God would be faithful to his promise. And God has said, I will put my fear in your heart. So pray, Lord, put greater measures of your fear in, my heart, in our hearts. Give us to walk in your fear. Give us these, the, more of the blessings and the graces of the new covenant. So it's cause for hope. It's cause for encouragement. It's cause for prayer. It's cause for imitation. It's cause for great thankfulness and gratitude to God for all that he has done for us in Christ. I wish I could take a half hour or so to open it up, but I can't. Now there's one final thing I want to show you about this. And you're going to, you're going to know something about me when I get done with this. You're going to know at least what I'm not. Well, would you turn with me, please, to Ezekiel 37. I promised I was going to do something like this, and I, I am going to do it in the few minutes that remain. Ezekiel 37. I want to show you how the Old Testament speaks about these things and how you have to understand some of these things. And if you don't understand it, this way, you can be led into all kinds of strange doctrines. Now here, on the left side, you have an Old Testament specific. And this is a type or a picture of a New Testament reality. Then you have the general or generic idea. And finally, you have the New Testament reality that is pictured through this general idea. Okay, now let's start to look at the five things that we have in Ezekiel 37, 24 and following. Okay? And speaking about bringing the people back into the land after their captivity, I have one, two, three, four, five. Now, it says, My servant David shall be king over them. They shall have one shepherd. And they shall walk in my ordinances and my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, your father's dwelt. They shall dwell therein, they and their children and their grandchildren forever. David my servant shall be prince over them. Moreover, I'll make a covenant of peace with them, and an everlasting covenant. And I will place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. And my tabernacle shall also be with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, what is this a description of? This is a description of the new covenant. This is the description of the everlasting covenant of peace. And the first thing that we read is an Old Testament specific, a certain king named David. Now, is that teaching that in the, area of the, in the era of the new covenant, David is actually going to come and be physically reincarnated and live on earth again. Is that what that's teaching? Does any of you believe that? You want to take the Bible literally? Do you believe that that's talking about a literal reincarnation of David? Would you be prepared to go that far? So what's the point? The point is that David, the general idea pictured in the person David, is the idea of the mediatorial king over the people of God. And there may be even in there not only the mediatorial king, but also the king who has who has received his kingdom and covenant with God. God's righteous servant David, the servant of the covenant that God made with him. And what is the New Testament reality pictured by this specific, which fits this generic idea? And the answer is Jesus Christ the son of David, the mediatorial king, David's heir, over the people of God in covenant with God who reigns on David's throne. And that's how the Old Testament uses Old Testament specifics through as pictures of a general idea to describe New Covenant and New Testament realities. 
And if you don't understand that principle, you come up with all kinds of strange doctrines and ideas from the Old Testament. And even from this text, the, if, you want to, if you don't understand that and apply that through here, you come up with all strange realities about the new covenant community that's going to be made. This is talking about Jesus Christ. And Jesus is pictured, is the name David is used, and it has to do with mediatorial king who rules over God's people. Then you also have that they're going to come back to the land of Canaan. And they're going to dwell in the land of Canaan. Now, what was the what was the land of Canaan to the old covenant people of God? It was their inheritance. Inheritance from God. It was their divine inheritance that God gave to his people over the under the old covenant. And what is the inheritance? In the new covenant reality, that's pictured. And what is that inheritance? Well, first of all, it's down payment is the Holy Spirit. And then heaven. And then the new heavens and earth. And the generic idea or the general idea that holds together this Old Testament specific and this new covenant reality is the idea of the divine inheritance that God gives to his people. It also says there's going to be a tabernacle in the midst. Does this mean that God's going to build up again a physical tabernacle, a physical temple? Absolutely not. What's this reality? This is God dwelling with his people. The special presence of God manifest in his, among his people. That's the tabernacle, the temple. That's what it, that's what it is. That's the reality. That's the general idea. And what is this? This is the presence of God, the special presence of God by the Holy Spirit that we now have and have been given from God. And God dwells with us and he has made each Christian the temple of God and every true church is the temple of God because we have the special presence of God by the Holy Spirit with us. This is a picture of the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is Hebrew... Israel. And these are the people of God. This is Hebrew Israel under the Old Covenant. And what is this a picture of? God's covenant people. God's redeemed heirs. In covenant with God. And what is this? This is a picture of Christian. Israel. Under the New Covenant. And then it speaks of their grand, their children and grandchildren forever, the successive generations of physical children. And what is this? This is the posterity that inherit the covenant blessing. From generation to generation. And who is this? Right? This is successive generations of spiritual children. All right? And you say, how can you read the Bible like that? Because I'm consistent. Okay, maybe I'm all wet. But if I'm not, if I'm going to, I'm going to treat everything else in this passage the same way I treat David. And either I'm going to believe that David is going to literally come among physical Jews and live in the land of Canaan among them and be their shepherd over them forever and ever with a physical tabernacle in the midst and going on from physical descent. And that's my new covenant hope. That's the covenant of peace that I'm supposed to hope for and look for. Either I'm supposed to believe that, which I absolutely do not believe, and it's contrary to the whole teaching of Scripture, or I'm going to be consistent in the way I think through a passage like that and every other Old Testament passage that describes New Covenant blessing in terms of Old Testament, then extant, physical, and specific realities. And it's obvious that it's not talking about a literal reincarnation of David or the perpetuation of physical Hebrew Israel by physical descent with a physical tabernacle 
in the land of Canaan forever and ever and ever. That is absolutely not what that text is talking about. Brethren, I cannot believe that that's what it means. Because it's totally inconsistent with everything else that the Bible teaches. Now, and you know what school of interpretation I don't belong to right now, don't you? You didn't say a word, but you know. You know. Because I don't mean to be polemical in these things. But I can't answer a question like that, a sincere question about the land, without honestly facing a text like that. Can't answer it without facing the realities of texts like that. Because there are a lot of texts like that in the Old Testament. And it's a matter of a hermeneutical principle. And that's how, that's how I understand it. And many others like it. And be consistent all the way through. Well, you think? I hope so. I sincerely hope so. He said to her, well, I'm, I'm, I'm finished. I got finished at two minutes after ten. I can't take credit for that because I went so fast and threw so much stuff at you tonight. I, I feel bad, but I hope you got it. At least some of it. You know, do you guys that have to take the test, you feel you feel ready to take it from what you heard tonight? Did, you, did I make clear to you about the about the, the covenant with the incarnate Christ, the covenant with Christian Israel? You got enough about that to feel ready to take that test? And I'll take that as a, I don't know. <laughs> Who, knows? Who knows? Right. Thank you, Tom. Did you have your hand up, brother? I believe you do. I never said a word. I, I, because of the things I have said tonight, I cannot with conscience embrace either dispensationalism or pedo baptism. But I didn't present these things to be polemical against any brother or any system or anything. I just presented it because I want to try to be honest to what the Word of God says. That is true. It doesn't matter what, frankly, it doesn't matter what I adhere to. It matters not. But what matters is, have we honestly, I have, have honestly, and I'm sure other brethren are honest too, I'm not saying that, but have we accurately uh, conveyed what the Bible teaches? That's what matters. And if we have, if we're right, keep us so. If we're not, make us so. In prayer, John Barrage, and lead us to the truth as it is in Jesus. Yes. Don't ask me now. You're not going to get another chance in the near future. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. Yes. I'm not really sure exactly what it's talking about. I know there are some people that entertain from that passage a hope that many or not most of physical Israel will be converted before the second coming of Christ. I hope they're right. I sincerely do. I, I hope they're right. If there's any text, I mean, you, you can you can explain away Hebrew uh, Romans 11 when it says uh, so in this way, uh, hutos in this manner, uh, all Israel will be saved. Meaning, in virtue of a remnant, there will be a remnant in every generation of Hebrews who believe in Christ. It's possible to explain it that way. There's another text that I have more difficulty explaining that way. It says where, where Peter says, "Repent, that he may send the Christ." And he talks to his Hebrew countrymen and he tells them to repent that the Christ may come. And could it be that what he's suggesting is that prior to the coming of Christ, there will be a widespread repentance among the Hebrews and that many of them will become Christians and be identified with Christian Israel, regrafted back into it, and then upon that, Christ will come. I surely hope that's what it means. And I hope that many of them do come to Christ. I, I bear absolutely no animosity whatsoever to Hebrew people. And they have a wonderful heritage from God. May God be pleased to save many of them and graft them back into what Paul calls their own holiday. And he tells us as Gentiles not to be high-minded but fear because if God didn't spare the natural branches when they sinned and didn't believe in the Messiah, how much more will he not spare us? So we need to walk softly as Gentiles and not arrogate to ourselves a sense of superiority over Hebrews because we are absolutely in no way superior to them. Yes, right. I beg your pardon? The, the text that he mentioned was in um, Romans chapter 11. The text that I mentioned was in Acts. I knew I should have looked it up before I came in today, and I didn't. It's either in Acts... I thought it was in Acts 3, but it may be in Acts 4.
Oh, yes. Here it is. It is Acts 3. It's Acts 3.19. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, so that there may come seasons of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who is appointed for you, even Jesus, whom the heaven must receive until the time of the restoration of all things. So he's talking about Christ coming from heaven back to earth, and he says, repent that he may send the Christ. He calls upon his Jewish countrymen to repent so that Christ may come again. And is that, does that indicate that prior to the second coming of Christ there will be a widespread repentance among the Jewish people? I surely hope so. I hope so. I hope that's what it means. Yes. I did not. The scripture does not explicitly say. It's possible to conceive of it as uh, explicitly connected, uh, as connected implicitly either with the Messianic covenant or with the New Covenant. You could see it either way. You could see it either as Jesus, when he, uh, when his seed is born, then as Abraham's seed, when they were born, were circumcised. So Jesus, the new patriarch of a multinational uh, humanity, when or a multinational uh, a seed from multi father, multitude of many nations, when his seed are born, they're circumcised in heart, and the outward evidence of that is baptism. So you could see circumcision related to Abraham's seed as baptism related to Jesus' seed, or you could see it this way: that in terms of mediating the new covenant, Jesus comes as a prophet, mediates the new covenant like John did. How does he separate? How does he how does he identify the community of the new covenant? He does it in terms of preaching the gospel, making disciples, and baptizing them. So you have baptism associated both with the new covenant and with the messianic covenant. And there's not one specific text that ties it exclusively or explicitly as a token to any any either of those two covenants. But you could see a connect I could see a connection to both. And since the Bible's not explicit, doesn't identify it, I won't want to be dogmatic about it. But what I would say is that um, it's not necessary that the Messianic Covenant necessarily has a token because the Davidic Covenant doesn't have any specific token given to it either, and it certainly is the pattern for the Messianic Covenant. So anyway, that's that's the best I could do with it. I just know that uh, it's it, it's it, it, the New Covenant community practices baptism and supper in accordance with the two the sacraments or institutions that Jesus instituted. And those are both intended to be a fence around the community. It's the, tenet, the baptism is supposed to mark out Jesus' disciples, and the supper is supposed to mark out the community that has all the blessings of the new covenant, and those two should be identical. Yes. Yes. No, to follow that through to conclusion. Well, I don't think that's what they would say. Because they would certainly say that baptism is a token of the covenant, number one. Oh, absolutely. It's a sign and seal of the covenant of grace. And they would and they would say that their children are included in the visible church. If you have a hymnal, we can read those things. I mean, we can read it. So and they, they, that, that's not what they're going to say. But anyway, um, how I would re- how would I would respond to that in a number of ways. I just I. I think that uh, to me it's abundantly clear that you don't have in the New Covenant community any class of people that don't take the Lord's Supper. The New Covenant community is the same community as the baptized disciples. You don't have two different communities. You have one in the same community. In the New Testament, they're exactly the same community. It was a community of the baptized disciples that he made the New Covenant. He didn't make it with a different community. So you're setting up two different communities. 
And in the New Testament, they're one and the same. That's the first problem I have. You set up a church within a church, which is emphatically not what you have in the New Testament. The very same group that were the community of baptized disciples are the very same group with whom he made the new covenant and gave them the supper. It's not two different groups. That would be my first answer. And that is part of the problem I have. You don't want to set up a church within a church. There's no such thing in the, new, in, the, in, 